All right. Hi there, everyone. Thank you for joining the Nevada Department of Wildlife for our conservation education program today. Uh, my name is Nicole St. John. I am an AmeriCorps wildlife educator here at the Nevada Department of Wildlife Office in Elko, Nevada, out here in the Eastern region. Before we get started um, today, we're going to be learning about the sagebrush step. Um, on the other end, as my moderator, I have Julie Gabrielson. She's going to be helping me out um, with moderating the chat box the question and answers some of you might have um, and then helping us out with some poll questions I have for you guys today as well. So just real quick before we get started, um, I want to give you guys some tips and tricks for Zoom in case we have some first time users out there. Um, on the middle of your screen, as it is right now, you probably have my little head in the corner uh, and then you have the presentation on the other side. If you hover your mouse over that light gray bar in the middle, you actually have the ability to adjust the sizing of the two screens. Um, whether you want to look at my face or the presentation, you can make the presentation a little bit bigger for you if you need to do that. Second, um, we are going to be doing some group participation in the chat box. So make sure that you have the option of communicating with all panelists and attendees. That way everybody can be involved um, and you do that by opening up the chat box and you should see a little gray box that indicates who you're communicating with. So again, let's make sure that that's open to all panelists and attendees as well. Uh, throughout the presentation today, I'm gonna prompt you guys to participate via some chat questions and we'll also have some poll questions for you. Um, and I'll be sure to prompt you guys for which format we're gonna be using for those questions. And I'll encourage you all to, to jump in and participate as well. So. With that said, let's go ahead and get started for today and thank you all for being here. So today's topic is the sagebrush step. We're gonna learn about one of Nevada's most prominent ecosystems um, and its value to some of the plants and wildlife species that we have here in the state of Nevada and across the West. So first question I have is what is a habitat? So by definition, a habitat is a natural place where a wild animal or plant lives. It's essentially their home. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask you guys to participate in our first chat question here. Um, a habitat, a healthy habitat has four main components that make up a habitat. So I'm curious, does anybody out there know what are the four components of a healthy habitat? Go ahead and you can type your answers in the chat box and then we'll talk about them as a group. Good, we've got one answer coming in. Water, food, shelter, and other animals. Water, food, and shelter. Looking good. All right, awesome. So it looks like everyone, a majority of people were getting, hitting hard on those three, food, water, shelter. Absolutely, those are needed. So um, the four components of a healthy habitat are food. As we discussed, you need to be able to find um, a source of food to keep yourself alive. Water, everything needs water. Shelter, and plant, a plant or an animal needs a way to protect itself from the elements or predators. And the last one is space. So food, water, shelter, and space. A plant or animal needs that space within their habitat to be able to live their daily lives. Um, as you can see, it's a little bit of a delicate balance of these four necessities in a habitat. Um, and when one of these components disappears, that's when we start to see complications in a habitat. So you can imagine if your favorite food source at home became uh, hard to find, it might cause a complication within your habitat there. Okay, moving on, what types of habitat do we have here in Nevada? So in the state of Nevada, we like to break it down into four main habitat types. Um, the first one is the montane habitat. So in a montane habitat, that's gonna be characterized by mountains, um, higher elevations. This is typically where we find our pine trees and trees with pine cones and pine needles. Um, colder elevations as well. Good example of this would be the Ruby Mountains out here in the eastern side of the state. Um, we've got peaks that reach around 10,000 feet or a little bit higher than that. Uh, and that is a real good example of the montane habitat. So moving down in elevation, we move into the sagebrush habitat. 
And that is going to be full of our grasses, wildflowers, um, lots of vegetation out there. It's made up of variable temperatures, so we can have high highs and low lows. Um, and it's more of a mid to high elevation area. So uh, one step down in elevation from the montane habitat. Um, this is a primary habitat type here in Nevada and many Nevada communities across the state uh, can be found in the sagebrush habitat. Our next habitat type is the low desert. So this is characterized by sparse vegetation. Um, it's much drier, much hotter, um, less available water on the landscape. Uh, and this is typically our lowest elevation habitat. So this ranges from um, below the sagebrush habitat all the way down to about below sea level. A good example of the low desert habitat is Las Vegas. Um, as you get farther south into our state, you start transitioning into that Mojave Desert. Um, and that is a good example of the low desert habitat. Lastly, we have our aquatic habitat. This one is special because it's not necessarily determined um, by elevation. It's determined by water availability. Uh, what I mean by that is you can find an aquatic habitat in any one of these other three habitat types that we talked about. For example, we have Lamoille Lake up in the Ruby Mountains here. That's an aquatic habitat in a montane area. Um, we've got South Fork Reservoir. Um, that's in a sagebrush community or sagebrush ecosystem. Um, and then we even have aquatic habitats in the low desert, such as Lake Mead um, or small streams and, and rivers out there as well. So our primary focus today is going to be sagebrush, the sagebrush habitat. Um, and we're going to move up in step in steps from habitat to ecosystems and even to a larger scale from there. Uh, and then we're going to focus in on Nevada in particular. Um, but we're going to go ahead and pull up our first poll question of the day. So Julie, if you want to go ahead and pull up that first poll question, um, this question is going to ask you guys, which habitat do you live in? So go ahead and vote in that poll. We'll leave that open for about 30 seconds or so, just to get an idea of where everyone's coming from today. Looking good, looking like a lot of sagebrush. All right, we'll go in that polling. Looks like a majority of us are coming from that sagebrush habitat. Um, and as you guys are gonna to learn today, it makes up a majority of our state here in Nevada. So excellent, thanks for sharing those results with us. And we'll go ahead and continue on. Okay, so now that we have a, a understanding of a habitat, I want to move us up in scale a step um, and we're going to talk about the relationship between a habitat and an ecosystem. So a habitat is specific to an individual plant or animal species. Um, it's much more localized, um, whereas an ecosystem is a little bit broader. So um, I like to think of a habitat as your neighborhood. It's a little bit smaller scale, um, but you've got those interactions going on on a daily basis uh, between the same species. And then we have an ecosystem. So that's where all plant and animal species live and interact with each other. Um, and this includes all of those abiotic and biotic compounds. So all those living and non-living compounds, all of those interact in one big circle um, to form a community. So I like to think of an ecosystem as a community. It's all those little parts working together. Um, and an ecosystem is actually made up of these habitats. So the key difference here between the two is scale. That's what's gonna um, differ here. Um, habitat is a little bit smaller scale where ecosystem is a little bit larger scale. All right. So you guys are gonna see this quite a bit today. This is one of my favorite sagebrush posters. It actually comes from the Rockies Audubon, um, but it does a really nice job of displaying um, the sagebrush ecosystem and the sagebrush step, which we're gonna learn about now. So as you guys could see, we use the term sagebrush step, and I'm sure you're wondering what is a sage, what is a step? What does that mean? So a step is essentially a step up from an ecosystem is a vast tract of land, and it's typically dominated by a certain vegetation type. So in this case, we're referring to the sagebrush step, 
um, and that is all inter interconnected sagebrush ecosystems across the western United States. So sagebrush is the dominant species here um, that covers most of this step and that's what we're going to focus in on today in particular. So as you can see it covers a large portion of the western United States. You can see in our map here. Um, it covers more area than any other rangeland type in North America. Um, approximately 160 million acres, give or take. Um, it actually covers 11 Western states across the US and expands into two Canadian provinces as well. So that's a lot of interconnected sagebrush ecosystems, um, which we lump into the sagebrush step. So, as you're driving across the Western United States, you see that green gray coloration um, and it seems like it continues on forever. So a term that some people like to use for that is the sagebrush sea. And when you hear that term, it's the sagebrush step. That's what they're referring to. It's an endless sea of sagebrush, gray green coloration as you drive across the West. Of course, there's going to be some slight differences um, in vegetation in the throughout these ecosystems. Um, if you're up in Washington, you might have some different plant species than we do down here in Nevada. Um, but the, the commonality between the sagebrush step and all these interconnected ecosystems is sagebrush. That's what brings them all together. So as you can see here, uh, Nevada is highlighted in blue. It covers, the sagebrush step covers a majority of our state. Um, another nickname for Nevada besides the Silver State or the Battleborn State is actually the Sagebrush State uh, due to the fact that Sagebrush covers a majority of our state. So you might be wondering why we are talking about the Sagebrush step today and why it's special. Uh, and the key point behind that is there are a vast array of plants and animals that rely specifically on this type of ecosystem for their survival. All right, so we are gonna bring up our next question here. And this one is going to be for you guys to participate via the chat again. Um, so I'm gonna leave this screen up for you for a little while. My question for you is what plants do you see here? Are there any plants that stick out to you that are familiar to you? Rabbit brush, sage, cactus, awesome. All right, so yeah, it looks like there's a few, few plants that stick out to us. Um, we're gonna go over some of these in specific. Um, some of these are of particular interest to the sagebrush step as well, so good job. All right, so as we're moving on, you guys nailed it. These are some of the common plants that we will see on the landscape and we're gonna move into some of these in even more detail, but just as a quick overview, um, Let's see if I can get my laser pointer out for you. So we've got sagebrush, definitely a big one you're gonna see here in the sagebrush step, given its name. Um, we've got rabbit brush, we've got perennial grasses. This down here is antelope bitter brush, some different cacti species, um, and lots of wildflower species as well. So moving on, let's talk about sagebrush, since that is a focal point of our, of our talk today. So sagebrush is the dominant species of the sagebrush steppe. Um, it's actually an emblem of the Western landscape in that sagebrush sea name. It's got that characteristic three lobed teeth and those very aromatic leaves. So um, it's a pale gray green in color and it's typically always that color. Uh, it likes to, it flowers in the fall and it's a yellow flower that forms at the top of the plant. Um, there are many different species of sagebrush out on the landscape, but typically we break it down into big sage and low sage, given the size of the sagebrush itself. Some common sa sagebrush species that you might find out there on the landscape include Wyoming big sage, mountain big sage, uh, and low sage. So sagebrush provides numerous resources to the sagebrush community. In fact, it has many services. Um, it actually provides a critical role in the hydrological cycle, so the water cycle. Sagebrush has deep tap roots that help retain water um, and help prevent soil erosion. 
on the western landscape and they also have the ability to pull that water that's deep down in the ground up to the surface for other plants. So sagebrush is actually known as a nurse plant because of those abilities. So it helps younger plants of different species, not necessarily sagebrush, uh, along in their lives by pulling that water to the surface for them so other plants can grow as well. In addition, it provides shelter for wildlife species and also is a food source for many wildlife species, which we're going to talk about here in a little, little bit later. So just a cool little fun fact for you guys, sagebrush is actually Nevada's state flower, hence how it ties back into being the sagebrush state. So I have another poll question for you guys. So Julie, if you will go ahead and pull up our next poll question. Um, this poll question for you guys pertains to sagebrush. So sagebrush has that unmistakable scent, right? You smell it, you know exactly what it's coming from. Where do we think that scent comes from? All right. Great, looks like about 75% of us voted, so that will work for us today. Looks like a majority of you guys voted leaves, which is correct. That aromatic smell um, comes from the leaves of the sagebrush. It actually produces a volatile oil in the leaves and it's a defense mechanism against some herbivores. So it's a way for the plant to, to save itself, to protect itself. All right, good job guys. So we'll go ahead and move on. So the next plant species we're going to talk about is rabbit brush. I know there was a few of you there in the chat question that pointed out rabbit brush right away. Um, it's a pretty common one here across the landscape. It's got those distinctive yellow flowers. So we actually have three common species here in Nevada. We've got rubber rabbit brush, green rabbit brush, and Perry's rabbit brush. Um, they're all pretty similar in shape. They've got that circular shape with those prominent yellow flowers. Um, those yellow flowers are actually a characteristic of the Asteraceae family. So um, many plants that are in that, in that family have yellow flowers and that actually includes sagebrush. So these, these two species, um, sagebrush and rabbitbrush, are actually from the same plant family. Um, the species are pretty, pretty easy to identify. Um, like we talked about, they have the same shape. But the main difference is rubber rabbit brush is a typically a little more green, gray, dusty in color um, and has more linear, hairy leaves, whereas the green rabbit brush and the Perry's rabbit brush are a little bit more bright green. Um, and those ones are the two that can be a little bit tougher to distinguish from one another. So sagebrush is also a dominant species of the sagebrush stuff alongside sagebrush. Um, it establishes quickly and does pretty well in disturbed areas. So it'll come up pretty quickly um, in areas that may have faced some disturbance. Um, and because of the amount of flowers it provides and the amount of leaves it has, it's actually a really nutritious plant for other plant species. Um, it provides a lot of leaf litter on the ground, which other plant species used to their benefit. All right, next we have perennial grasses. So perennial grasses are really important on the landscape in the sagebrush steppe. Um, there's several different species that inhabit this, this steppe. Um, some common species that you might find here in Nevada though include Great Basin Wild Rye, um, which if we get my laser pointer out here is this one here. Um, and then Indian rice grass, which is pictured up here. You've got Sandberg's bluegrass. And we also have Idaho fescue. Those are some of the common species that you'd find on the landscape here in Nevada. So a perennial grass is well rooted and grows continuously year after year. That's how it differs from an annual grass. Just means that it's, it's rooted and comes back year after year and completes its life cycle in um, more than two years, more than just a year. So they're typically much more healthy for the sagebrush ecosystem, mostly because they provide stability on the landscape um, and they provide water and nutrient retention because they have the better root system and come back year after year versus just complete their life cycle in one year. Uh, because there's varied timing for regrowth of these different species, it provides a really 
um, strong source of forage for wildlife out there on the landscape. This is some of their favorite food. All right, and our last plant we're gonna talk about are wildflowers. Um, another term that biologists use for wildflowers is a forb. A forb just means it's an herbaceous flowering plant that is not a grass. So the key phrase there is it's not a grass um, and it flowers. So wildflowers and forbs are synonymous with each other. Um, as you can see, forbs come in all shapes and sizes on the sagebrush step. Um, here are some of our common ones. We've got lupin up here, which typically has these purple flowers and these kind of arrow shaped leaves or uh, finger shaped leaves, sorry. Then moving over here, we have arrow leaf balsam root. That's one of my favorites. You'll see that quite a bit. We've got flocks. This here is prickly flocks. We have some other species on the landscape as well, but they're all pretty similar in flower shape and size. And Indian paintbrush, that distinctive bright red paintbrush shape to it. So forbs are really important on the landscape because they're very nutritionally valuable for wildlife species. And they also serve a purpose in providing soil coverage on the landscape as well. All right, so moving back to our favorite poster here, I'm gonna encourage you guys to go ahead and participate again via chat. I'll leave this up for you for a little while to look around the poster. And my question for you is what animals do you see here? What stands out for you for wildlife here? Go ahead and participate in the chat box here. I see a snake, good. Got rabbits, pronghorn, sage grouse. Awesome. Frogs, lizards. Someone even spotted the coyote way back there. Harrier. Badger. Fox. Definitely. All right, awesome. Good job, guys. Yep, you guys nailed it. So we've got quite an array of wildlife species there. The one, some of the ones we're gonna focus in on today include these five. Um, we've got the pronghorn antelope, um, the sagebrush bull. He was hiding down there in the grass. He might've been a little bit harder for you to see. We've got the sage thrasher, the greater sage grouse, and the pygmy rabbit. So the first wildlife species we're gonna focus on today is the pronghorn antelope. He's actually the fastest land mammal that we have here in North America. Um, they can run up to speeds of about 65 miles per hour, which is very, very fast. Uh, fun little fact about these guys is that they are unique because they are not related to the African uh, antelope species. They're actually more closely related to the giraffe than the African species of, prong, or of antelope. So um, again, they're pretty unique because they're more closely related to the And um, they actually get their name from those pronged horns on their heads. Um, they are actually the only deer-like species. And I say deer-like because they're not in the same family as mule deer. Um, they're actually in their own family um, and they actually shed their horns every year. So usually when we use the term horns, it means a more permanent structure, um, but they shed this sheath on the outside of their uh, head, their antler or horns here, excuse me, um, in the fall every year. It actually falls off and regrows. So these guys rely on sagebrush leaves as a winter source. It actually makes up the majority of their winter diet. Um, and you might be wondering how they get around those volatile oils that we talked about uh, in the sagebrush leaves. And they actually have an adaptation. Um, it's an enzyme in their stomach that allows them to break down those compounds so that they're able to digest those leaves. Oops. All right, moving on to our next species. We have the sagebrush vole. So this guy's really cute. Looks a little bit like a mouse, but he's not. Um, he relies heavily on the sagebrush ecosystem. Um, he likes to burrow in the loose soils at the base of the big sagebrush plants, so he uses it for shelter. Um, and his diet also consists of sagebrush flowers that have fallen to the ground, sometimes the leaves, um, forbs, and the grasses within the ecosystem. 
Typically they live in colonies um, and they're also a crepuscular species. So what that means is they're most active during the morning and evening hours. Uh, you can typically find them out and about doing their thing. So with this species in particular, a lot of research still needs to be done. There's still a lot that we don't know about his biology. Um, so in past years, we have had biologists on the landscape uh, performing some more research to better understand this species. All right, next we have the sage thrasher. This guy's really cool. He's actually the smallest of the thrasher species. He typically forages on the ground and in between shrubs, um, but he will perch on the shrubs and up on sagebrush like you see in the photo there um, to eat berries and flower parts and um, get a visual of the landscape and keep an eye out for predators as well. These guys rely on the sagebrush in particular for nesting. They nest exclusively in the sagebrush, um, typically in the branches near the base of the plant in the spring or the summer. Um, when they're in migration and during the winter, they can be found in a little bit more variable habitat types. Um, but when it's nesting season, they will be found in the sagebrush. So populations of this particular species are actually um, in decline and it's mostly due to habitat loss. Um, we are losing stands of sagebrush uh, and these guys, because they rely on it for nesting, um, it's affecting their, their reproductive status. Fun little fact about this guy, uh, he likes to mimic other birds' songs. So I don't know if any of you have ever heard a mockingbird sing. Um, but they actually nicknamed this guy the Mountain Mockingbird due to the fact that he likes to mimic other birds. All right, we've got another bird species for you here. Um, this is the greater sage grouse. So he's a very iconic bird of the West. Um, when you think of sagebrush and the Western landscape, a lot of people's minds go straight to this guy, the greater sage grouse. So, it's actually the largest member of the grouse family. As you can see in this photo here, um, that's the male in full display. He's got those crazy looking tail feathers, um, the big white chest, which actually holds those yellow air sacs that he uses to display. Uh, and he's got those little eye combs and those funny looking little feathers on his head as well. That is the male. And then those are two hens sitting right next to him. So as you can see, the males are much bigger than the females. So these guys are cool because they're famous for their bizarre um, yet fascinating mating rituals. Um, they've got that funny little dance they do out there on the landscape. We actually refer to that as lecking behavior. Uh, and a lek is the term that biologists use for the grounds where these birds return to year after year to mate and display and do their dance on the landscape. So that's a lek. That's typically mid-March through mid-May. So we just got out of the lecking season for this year. These guys rely on the sagebrush ecosystem um, every aspect of their life cycle. Um, they rely on it for mating or lecking. They rely on it for roosting. They rely on it for nesting, um, raising their young. Uh, and they also rely on it for food. Their diet consists of grasses, forbs, insects, and sagebrush leaves. It kind of depends on what time of the year and what they prefer, um, but they heavily rely on sagebrush leaves, particularly in the winter. Just like the pronghorn, these guys also have an ability to get around those harsh compounds found in the sagebrush leaves. They actually excrete a blackish green tar, um, which is known as a sequel tar, and that's just the, the compounds that they aren't able to, aren't able to digest. So Nevada actually has the second most priority sage grouse habitat out of all of the Western states. So um, with all the sagebrush we have in this state here, that means we've got a lot of priority sage grouse habitat as well. All right, the last species we're gonna cover today is the pygmy rabbit. This guy is super cute, as you can see from that photo. Um, he's the smallest native rabbit here in North America. He actually only weighs about a pound at most and can fit in the palm of your hand. So he's, he's pretty tiny. Um, it's actually one of only two species of rabbits in North America that digs its own burrows. Um, this is typically done at the base of big sagebrush. 
um, but he digs his own burrows where most other rabbit species are a little bit more opportunistic. They'll take adva advantage of what they can find out there in the landscape that's already dug for them. So these guys also rely heavily on sagebrush leaves in the winter. Um, it makes up almost 100% of their diet. Here in Nevada, the pygmy rabbit is actually a species of special concern. What that means is um, it's one that we're putting further study into to better understand. Uh, and we actually think that their populations might be declining also due to habitat loss and just low population sizes in general. They're, they're pretty restricted uh, on where they're able to, to live. All right, so I have one more chat question for you guys here, and I encourage you guys to participate via chat. Um, my question for you is what do these five species, these five wildlife species we just covered all have in common? There's one commonality between them. Good. Sagebrush, everyone's co coming in with some really good answers here. They all share the step and they eat sagebrush. Sagebrush is an important factor. Great, you guys are nailing it, good job. Relying on sagebrush, yep. So you guys got it, good job. Um, all of these species are what we consider sagebrush obligates. So by definition, a sagebrush obligate, obligate is dependent on the sagebrush and the sagebrush step um, for one aspect of their lives, whether it be food, shelter, um, or nesting or breeding purposes, all five of those species that we just covered um, in some way, shape or form rely heavily on sagebrush um, to make it work, to make their lives. All right, so in conclusion, the sagebrush step supports an array of plants and animals here in Nevada um, that has a intrinsic value. So what that means is it has a value in its own and for what it just provides for being what it is. Um, it also has a value for the plants and wildlife species that we just covered, as well as a value for humans. So we rely on it for hunting and recreational purposes. We rely on it for natural resource and energy development. And we also rely on it for grazing for livestock. So not only does it provide uh, value for wildlife species, it also provides value for recreational and economical purposes for us as well. Lastly, I just wanna pop up this little slide here for you guys. Um, these are some additional resources and activities if you want to further explore the sagebrush step. Um, these websites are all great. Um, the fireworks curriculum in particular has a lot of cool little activities for kids um, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service link there at the bottom. They've got a lot of tools for educators um, and ad additional webinars that you guys can explore as well. So with that, that is the end of our presentation today. Um, but before we go, I want to open it up for any questions that we may have lingering out there that I wasn't able to answer for, answer for you guys live. So feel free to use the question and answer box if you have any remaining questions out there. So Nicole, there are a couple that we had prior to um, our little technology glip. So I'll, I'll read them to you in case you can't see them. Okay, um, sounds good. One was, one was asking where the poster is available at, where they can find the Sagebrush Step poster at. Yeah, so I can go back to the very first time I put it up. I actually have a link there, um, but it's actually through, if you look on the Audubon Rockies site, and that'd be that first link there, that's where you can find that poster. And then I see another question here, um, which areas in Nevada does the pygmy rabbit live? Um, he can be found throughout the state, but we have a pretty prevalent population out here on the eastern side of the state, um, in particular around um, the Wine Cup Ranch area and Highway 93 North there. I see another question here, are there any trees common in the sagebrush step? So for the most part, um, the sagebrush step is dominated by sagebrush and shrubs that are lower in height than that. 
that said, we do have a few tree species that will find their way in there, um, or as you get into some higher elevation sagebrush areas. For example, we have service berry, which will typically, typically is a shrub, but can grow into tree height. Um, we also have the pinion juniper, um, which is a shorter statured tree that you can find in the sagebrush step as well. So I have one more question here. When does sagebrush bloom compared to rabbit brush? So both of those species bloom in the fall. I see one question here. How is sagebrush useful for energy production? Or where can I find more information? Um, in terms of sagebrush for energy production, um, I don't know if it's necessarily directly linked to that. Um, however, we do have some big solar unit areas or wind farms that can be found in sagebrush ecosystems, mostly because it's pretty windy there. So it's a good way to generate some uh, wind production there. Um, a good place to maybe find some more information on energy production and how those two relate um, would, be, would maybe be that U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service link, and that's the last link displayed on the on the slide there. So nocturnal nocturnal animals that rely on sagebrush um, kind of depends on what you refer to as nocturnal. There's a lot of species that are out and about at night. Um, a coyote hunts at night, mountain lions hunt at night, um, and they will use the sagebrush step as hunting grounds and habitat as well. All right. Um, what is the name of the sagebrush? So um, I, I'm not quite sure what, you're, what we're referring to in terms of the name, um, but sagebrush, oh, here we go, has purple flowers on it and found in the Reno area. So if I had to guess from what you're referring to, um, I think it's actually called bud sage. And it's, it's a little bit tricky. It looks just like sagebrush, but it's not in the sagebrush family. So it is actually not a sagebrush. Where can you find pronghorn? So pronghorn you can find throughout the state. Um, they're pretty well-rounded species and you can find them uh, almost anywhere. Nicole, you do have one that came through in the chat asking about the sage thrasher and okay. if there's any possibility of finding them in the Reno Sparks area. Yeah, I, um, that I'm not 100% sure of. I think if you were able to kind of get out and about and out of the city limits um, and you were in a sagebrush dominant area, um, there's potential that you could find the sage thrasher there. All right. Um, unless there's any additional questions, I think that's all we have for you all today. Um, I just want to thank you all for attending this Nevada Department of Wildlife Conservation program. Um, and I encourage you to come back to our future webinars. And you guys will all get a link for um, a survey that will be sent to your email. If you guys could go ahead and complete that, it just gives us some feedback on how we did and what we can do to improve and make this experience better for you all next time. So thank you all and have a great rest of your day.